All of this with Michigan Congressman Thaddeus McConnor. He knows legislation like I know tribulation. Congressman, always a pleasure having you on our humble little show. You look dapper as always. No, thanks for having me, Greg. Oh, my pleasure. Okay. <laughs> All right, I want to talk to you about the Climate Gate scandal. Uh, do you think any of these leaked emails are a smoking gun that reveals that the whole global warming movement is a steamroller against dissent? Or is it just not a big deal, as Bill Schultz and other idiots claim? Hey! <laughs> well, I would have to agree with you on the Bill Schultz part, but I don't know that, <laughs> that all the evidence is in yet. But always, the concern has been the politicization of science with the climate change argument and with the global warming theory. And as we've talked about on Red Eye before, Greg, mm -hmm. our generation was told by the very same people that we were going to freeze to death in the next ice age. Mm -hmm. Now, magically, they tell us 30 years later that we're all going to burn to death in global warming. The science that this was based on is critical because there is no resolution to this. Science works on empirical facts, not political conjecture or an ideological agenda. And what you're seeing coming out of the reports about the emails and the loss of data that was used to build these models, you're starting to understand that this seems to be more of a political agenda than anything that has to do with scientific empirical fact. Well, you know, here's the thing. It's like uh, the, the, the people that are, that are, are on the other side uh, are pro climate change are saying, oh, these, you know, these emails are just nothing. They do. But they are actually it's about suppressing evidence. Isn't that a crime? Well, I don't know if it's a crime for them as an institution, an academic institution, to do that. But let's just think about it, Greg. Remember, the people who talk about the melting of the glaciers and others. Imagine if you were in a peninsula around uh, 1000 B.C. or so, or early, and your name was Tor, and you were out hunting Mastodon. And you didn't notice that the glaciers were melting and leaving the devastating flooding in its wake that became the Great Lakes in the state of Michigan. So I think that what we have to do is go back in history and look at this and realize that the, the Earth has been here a long time to take solutions collective periods of time and say that somehow this proves that there's a man-made global warming occurring is absolutely wrong. We have to look at the different periods in history, we have to look at the different effects, and then we have to have a direct empirical data to correlate between man's activity and the effect on the planet. And that is yet to be proven, and I highly doubt that it's going to be any time soon. Is this going to have any effect whatsoever on the upcoming Copenhagen summit? Well, it's going to have, if we continue on the cap and trade, national energy tax path that we're on, or the global Copenhagen Treaty regarding climate change, quote unquote, what's going to happen is a whole lot of Americans are going to lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. As you know, in my state of Michigan, we're a manufacturing state. We've been very hard hit by this recession. And if you start to make it harder for people to produce, to manufacture, to make things in the United States rather than simply consume them, you're going to continue to see this consumptive economy consume jobs. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is get back to sane policies that allow people to make things, people to make a living for themselves, to pursue their happiness in the United States, to pursue their prosperity through the private sector rather than wait for the largesse of the public sector to try to do it for them. We have to get past ideology and get back to reality. The real people are hurting and they want to work. We shouldn't make it harder. Yes. I, I, I have to say, you know, I was thinking about Copenhagen. I came up with an idea for Ben and Jerry's ice cream called Hopenhagen, and it's like globes of white chocolate and a swirl of CO2 fudge. What do you make of that? I'm about to retch. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about... Uh, uh, Obama's speech tomorrow in Afghanistan, uh, he's, he's going to announce the deployment of troops, probably 35,000 or so, fewer than what General McChrystal wanted. Uh, what do you make of this decision? Well, one, it's long overdue. When you run for the presidency of the United States, you have to consider that as a nation at war, you will have a policy to put in place if you are elected commander-in-chief of the United States Armed Forces. That aside, as long as the commanders on the ground believe that this is going to bring us to victory, to help America keep her word that we're going to liberate the Afghan people from the Taliban and root out al-Qaeda to destroy this scourge to humanity, then I will support this policy. If it is by the commanders on the ground, not effective, not going to continue this mission and lead it successfully, then I will not support it. What do you, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned victory. Is this really, uh, the issue with President Obama is it's, there's never any, any mention of winning or victory. It's more about exhalation and an exit. I mean, does it concern you that perhaps, you know, the whole idea of winning is kind of distasteful?
Well, we had this not only with this administration, but we had these arguments in the past with the Bush administration as well, where they talked about success, where they talked about failure. When you ask American men and women to risk their lives defending our freedom and expanding it to others, you should be honest about the moral consequences and your goal should be victory. You should not mute it with terminology or some Orwellian turn of phrase. This is life and death. It is about the future of our country. It is about the survival and the success of our troops in performing their mission. We should be clear about what our objective it is it is victory it is security through the expansion of liberty there you go uh, one last, last quick question I just want to touch you on the, about these uh, White House crashers what do you make of this is this a serious issue well, I think it's very disconcerting, and they should get to the bottom of this, Greg. In all seriousness, President yeah. Obama is our first African-American president. The, the threats to his security are greater than many of the presidents we've right. ever had, probably preeminent amongst them. Mm -hmm. And to have this type of lapse of security is very dangerous. We have to make sure that the President of the United States, especially in a war for freedom against terrorism, with enemies that will do anything to kill people in an elective office or American civilians, we have to protect the president. And they have to get to the bottom of how this was allowed to happen. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Congressman. Always a pleasure having you on the show. See you soon. Uh, best of luck with everything, whatever you're doing and wherever you are.